Today we're looking at vehicles on film, but we're not just breaking things down into the traditional auto categories. We're looking at the different psychological functions of the automobile on screen. And no, we don't have any idea how ridiculous that sounds. These are our picks for the top 10 best movie cars of all time. One of the most common kinds of cars you see turn up on film from an emotional perspective is the car as a sense of freedom. They're the wind in your hair, the feeling of the open road, the provider of possibilities. In movies with this kind of car, they often represent the limitlessness of the future. Recently, Nomadland's converted cargo van was a pretty perfect example of this. The car itself is escape incarnate, but this could also be the flying Ford Anglia from Harry Potter, carrying Harry away from the Dursley's prison. It's most cars from Cannonball Run and its predecessor, the Gumball Rally, flying across the country as if nothing were impossible, although we like the Cobra and front-winged LP400S the most. It's Easy Rider's Captain America Panhead, it's Luke's Land Speeder, in a very funny kind of way, it's the Limousine from Holy Motors. But for our number 10 pick, we think there's nothing quite like the 1970 Challenger RT440 Magnum from Vanishing Point. Sporting a live free or die attitude from the beginning to the very end, Vanishing Point is essentially one feature film long car chase. Former police officer, Vietnam vet, and motorcycle racer Kowalski attempts to get from Denver to San Francisco in less than 36 hours, popping uppers to stay awake as he does. The cops, shockingly, do not appreciate his plan and go to great pains to thwart him, so he tears across the American West, delighting in their inability to slow him down. And the beast in which he does it seems to find as much joy in it as him, throwing itself around corners and across salt flats with an ease that is, at separate times, both violent and serene, screaming down the asphalt and then pirouetting out in the open. Its roaring supercharged engine seems to promise enough power to escape any net, while its gorgeous rear end is exactly what everyone's going to be staring at as it leaves them in the dust. Adjacent to our previous category, we next find the car as act of rebellion. These cars don't just represent freedom to steer towards any kind of future, but freedom from anyone telling you what the hell you can or cannot do. They're a middle finger to the law, with enough vinegar under the hood to back it up. You find clear examples of this kind of car in Thunder Road's rum-running Ford 50, Bandit's beer-running 77 Trans Am, and Thelma and Louise's 66 Thunderbird, which takes their rebellion all the way up to the edge and over it. The Bluesmobile literally shouts its rebellion from its rooftop while dressed up in retired cop car clothes. However, for our number nine pick, we're going with a very special little 61 Ferrari 250 GT California from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. If you had access to a car like this, would you take it back right away? Neither would I. In a film that holds Bueller's freewheeling truancy in tension with Cameron's hypochondriatic repression, the Ferrari 250 in Barchetta Red is the perfect representation of the teenage struggle with being one's own person despite what others tell you. It is the ultimate embodiment of teenage boys' grown-up fantasies, a caged stallion that needs to be let loose, and an on-screen representation of his off-screen father. Sure, they steal the car to skip school in a pretty classic teenage rebellion move, but it is more in its destruction, the moment where Cameron finally retakes the driver's seat in his own life, that it represents both the means of rebellion and the thing to be rebelled against. Of course, neither the car they drove nor the car they crashed were actual Ferrari 250 GTs. Cameron wasn't lying when he said less than 100 were ever made, and they couldn't afford to trash a car that now sells for $10 million. But the unlicensed replica nailed the details, and one glance at it still captures the unmistakable feeling of living on your own terms. In other movies, a car isn't a car so much as it stands in as a symbol of something else. Maybe a symbol of past trauma like Dom's Charger from The Fast and the Furious, or a symbol of family as in Roma. A symbol of love, like Grease Lightning, or a symbol of folly, hubris, and the woefully insufficient precautions taken in Jurassic Park. 
Better Off Dead's Camaro is a symbol of progress and growth, while the Killdozer in Tread serves as a terrifyingly real symbol of a man's rage born physical in metal and concrete. However, our favorite car here is a symbol of a dream, the 1948 Tucker sedan. Ladies and gentlemen, don't let a Tucker pass you by. In most films, a car is something you drive, but in Tucker, A Man in His Dream, it's something to be imagined, designed, built, and then crushed in Francis Ford Coppola's little scene ode to the first American dream and then the American reality. And in this case, that dream takes the form of the Tucker Torpedo, the car of tomorrow, and a fantasy carried by the buoyancy of its inventor's belief, despite pretty much everyone else trying to tear it down. The car itself is a brilliant and beautiful machine decades ahead of its time in its attempts to revolutionize safety, aerodynamics, engineering, and aesthetics with innovations like seat belts, swiveling headlights, and fuel injection, all in the 1940s. And it wasn't fiction. The film, the car, and its struggles are based on a true story story, and to this day the 46 surviving Tucker 48s stand as a testament to the power of a man's dream. There are a couple other symbols that cars tend to appear as that are so ubiquitous they get their own dedicated category. And the first of those is the car as status symbol. It's not something you drive so much as it's something you wear. And there are a million of these in loads of movies. All of Tony Stark's Audis, real and imaginary, are a testament to his wealth. The fictional Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the 6000 SUX, the long coveted Benz from Mercedes Mon Amour, to the point of excess in The Great Gatsby's, both the 28 Rolls Phantom and the Duesenberg Model J. And boy, is it hard not to pick the 32 five window coupe from American Graffiti, especially because our number seven pick is only half the car it is, but it's twice the status symbol, so we gotta go with our gut. We're talking about Kaneda's motorcycle from Akira. So yeah, maybe we should have called this list the top 10 best motor vehicles in movies, but that just didn't have the same ring to it. But as far as this categorical function of the motor vehicle is concerned, Kaneda's vaguely BMW-ish bike is as meaningful a status symbol as it gets. First of all, it's bad as hell like effortlessly cool. Even in a futuristic world where all the fashion is designed to be next level, it's immediately recognizable as a machine worthy of great envy. And then of course, Kaneda starts driving it. So fast the taillights trail behind it, power sliding into a gang battle without so much as a flinch. It's something anybody watching just has to covet. And so does Tetsuo, hyper-focused on the bike as a physical incarnation of his childhood friend's superiority. He tries to steal it and then destroy it, lashing out at not just Kaneda, but at the ways in which he has always felt small compared to him that the bike represents, as if the imbalance of their whole relationship were born between its two wheels. The other car symbol that gets its own slot shows up when cars are to serve as indicators of masculinity. For our number six slot, we're looking at the car as a phallic symbol. This is the monster truck from Take This Job and Shove It. It's the Trans Am from Hooper. And who can argue that Frank Bullitt's Mustang GT and all things phallic going on here, here, or here are anything but projections of their considerable masculinities. Immortan Joe was compensating so hard he put a car on his car and created the Giga Horse, while Ronin's Audi represents a less insecure, more practical, workmanlike alternative view of masculinity that we think fits its character really well. But our pick in this slot goes completely the other direction. About as obvious a phallic symbol as a car can be, we're talking about the pussy wagon. This neon yellow lifted Chevy Silverado complete with flame decals, name decals, and matching vanity plate is an unbelievably over-the-top pastiche of fragile masculinity. Originally owned by the world's worst nurse-turned-comatose brothel keeper Buck, the pussy wagon's questionable decor decisions tell you everything you need to know about its original owner. But it's what happens to the car next that really cements its brilliance. After killing Buck, the bride steals it for her own vengeful ends in a reclamation of her own power. She takes ownership over the fragile masculinity that sought to take advantage of her. She gains the upper hand over his pathetic, false projection of power, and in so doing renders its symbolism all the more potent. 
No matter how big your four-wheel member, it can't protect you from your own demise. Sometimes the desirability of a car isn't so much about its engines and wheels or even its look as much as it is about all the cool shit it can do. This is the car as gadget, where you don't want to drive it so much as you want to play with it. We're talking Speed Racer's Mach 5 and the earlier Batmobiles, Green Hornet's Black Beauty, obviously the Gadgetmobile, double obviously the DeLorean, less obviously the Pinchcliffe Grand Prix's Il Tempo Gigante, whose two engines register on the Richter scale and propel the car forward with its own radar and blood bank for all your, you know, regular everyday commuter needs. And then there's the 66 Black Lightning that can freaking fly. But the prize here was always going to go to James Bond, who's driven some of the coolest gadgets with wheels never invented. Most notably, the remote controllable 750 IL, the custom flamethrowing DB10, the V8 Vantage with retractable skis, the subnautical Lotus Esprit, and our pick, the tricked out Aston Martin DB5, originally from Goldfinger. Where's my Bentley? Oh, it's had its day, I'm afraid. Well, it's never let me down. M's orders, 007. You'll be using this Aston Martin DB5 with modifications. Now, pay attention, please. V classic Bond car. The silver DB5 prototype driven by Sean Connery sports all the extra features you miss out on when you only buy the base trim model. Smokescreen, homing device, ejector seat, ah! bullet shield, oil slick dispenser, machine gun lights, wheel blades inspired by Ben-Hur, and revolving license plates inspired by the director getting too many parking tickets. By Thunderball, it had water cannons. By Goldeneye, it had a printer communicator in its radio and a champagne fridge beneath the armrest. The car isn't just a svelte ride, there's a sense of limitlessness with it. It's got an answer to everything. It's a partner in crime, the ultimate getaway machine, and a massive toy for grown-ups. It's a treasure trove of rewarding buttons just begging to be pushed that brings out a childish sense of gadgety glee as it reveals its surprises, which, in a lot of ways, is why it endures. The sense of wonder to it, the longing to explore all its satisfying features that keeps our daydreams constantly wandering back. Along similar lines to gadget cars, we find our next logical subset of the film mobile, the car as weapon. This isn't your average transpo, it's a killing machine, a vehicular embodiment of violence. Probably the most obvious examples here are the cars of the various death race films, but it's also Batman's Tumblr, the Army of Darkness's Olds, the Great Race's gorgeously twisted Hannibal Twin 8, and Stripes' ridiculous urban assault vehicle. Death Proof's Chevy Nova is a weapon for its passengers, and there's a town full of awesome-looking weaponized coupes in the cars that ate Paris, the movie that inspired the series behind our number four pick, Mad Max, which has the familiar buzzards, the peacemaker, the war rig, the doof wagon, but come on, this one goes to Max's Interceptor Pursuit Special. The 1973 Ford XB Falcon GT351, the last of the Pursuit Specials, was a Ford muscle car designed and built for the Australian market, with 5.8 liters of V8 under the hood and, in Max's case, a whole lot of supercharger sticking out of it. Originally offered to Max to entice him not to leave the police force in the original film, the car is ultimately turned into a weapon to be reckoned with. However, unlike other movies, its weaponization has less to do with cleverly attached hidden machine guns and fancy blades, although it has a few surprises than it is with the absolute power, durability, and punch necessary to wreak some serious vengeance. And it's in Road Warrior, three years on, booby trapped, the gloss worn off and rusted in the rear modified to hold long distance fuel tanks, that the vehicle takes on its most vicious sneer. There is no secret formula to the Interceptor's lethal efficiency, no firepower cleverly hidden in its bumpers, just raw, unbridled, devastating power. Closing in at number three, we're looking at cars that serve to symbolize a character, either embodying their personality or standing in as their proxy. In one way or another, they're inextricably linked with their driver. Think the Mirthmobile or the Gran Torino Rust Bucket. They're Wayne and the Dude in vehicular form. 
There's also Austin Powers' Shaguar, John Wick's Mustang, Lone Star and Barf's Eagle 5, Hulot's camper car from Traffic, and the ridiculous Mutt's Cuts van from Dumb and Dumber. But beyond a single character, some cars serve as an extension of a relationship, or a unit, or a team. Most literally, the A-Team van, or the Mystery Machine, but also the Ecto-1. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Chrysler LeBaron, National Lampoon's Vacations, Hilarious Wagon Queen Family Truckster, and our favorite stand-in for a family, the Volkswagen T2 from Little Miss Sunshine. Come on, I'm putting it in gear! This 1979 Transporter Type 2 surely isn't the fastest car on this list, and it surely isn't the best maintained. The horn has a mind of its own, and the first few gears don't really work, but boy does it sure have character. In some ways, the Little Miss Sunshine van is like another member of the family, complicated, fussy, with her own quirks and baggage that need to be taken care of, even as the family is counting on her to take care of them. But in other ways, it's more emblematic of their family as a whole. It not only carries them, it stands in for them, represents them. When they're working, it's working. When they're not, neither is it. And its unique qualities reflect back on the nature of the Hoover family. Overly optimistic, a little out of touch, stuck in a bit of a rut, but an absolute blast at its best. Beyond standing in for a character, there are some cars that are actual characters. Your Lightning McQueens, your Bumblebees. It's not a movie, but this could be Kit, Benny the Cab, RC from Toy Story, Herbie the Love Bug, and don't you dare forget the cat bus from my neighbor Totoro. However, we think the most interesting version of this occurs when the car isn't just any old character, but the villain. This is the Satan in Lincoln Continental form in the car. Maybe the Devil Z from Wan Gun Midnight. For all intents and purposes, it's the Peterbilt 281 from Duel, because you pretty much never see the driver. From our perspective, it's just a truck doing the terrorizing. However, for this one, we have to go with a 1958 Plymouth Fury from Christine. You know, I thought girls were supposed to be jealous of other girls, not cars. This car's a girl. Oh, please. Really? Cut it out. Don't. What? Don't like you slapping your girl? Toreador Red with silver dart styling, this fury sure makes evil look good. Based on the Stephen King novel of the same name, Christine is about a classic car's jealous relationship with her new owner. The owner, Arnie, is a geek who gains newfound confidence in the restoration of this classic Plymouth. And, behind its stunning bodywork and that oh-so-sexy V splitting down her front fender, Christine has her own rap sheet, a history littered with corpses and a number of supernatural abilities. She's not just possessed, she's also very possessive. And she doesn't like anyone else messing with her man. The film finds a really nice compromise between car that just kinda kills for no reason and fully sentient human in the shape of a car. Christine is more than just a machine, but the human qualities she's taken on follow intelligently from the form and function of her automotive roots, allowing the film to extend the allegory of man's relationship with his vehicle into the realm of horror. It's fun, it's creepy, she's absolutely gorgeous, and while this Plymouth Fury is one of the best cars ever to appear on screen, she's definitely not one you'd ever want to own. I think it was Freud who once said that sometimes a car is a phallic symbol, while other times it's just a smooth ride. So, closing us out with our number one pick, we're dispensing with the symbolism and looking at those rare, rare occasions where a car really is just a f***ing car. And what are the coolest cars as cars ever put to film? Maybe Ford vs Ferrari's blistering GT40? Or Grand Prix's sexy McLaren M2B? Could be gone in 60 seconds Eleanor? Or Tulane Blacktop's Ripper custom Chevy? And honestly, we kind of love the Peugeot 406 from Taxi and the Toyota AE86 from Initial D. If we were choosing solely based on horsepower and top speed, we're pretty sure Redline's Trans Am 20,000 WR is the only one hitting quintuple digits. However, in terms of pure automotive perfection, we don't think there's ever been a movie car built that can top the heavenly Porsche 917K from Le Mans.
Porsche's early 70s short tail racing prototype 917K sports a 4.5 liter flat 12 making 520 horsepower at the brake and turned heads in baby blue and orange. The car that McQueen drove in the film sold for $14 million in 2017 and is the most expensive Porsche in existence. Filmed in part during the actual 24-hour Le Mans race in 1970, the production had to enter camera cars into the competition field to capture the footage they wanted, and one of the cars was McQueen's personal Porsche, with which he had recently placed second in the Sebring 12-hour, although they had to make extra pit stops to change out rolls of film. There is perhaps no other film that so viscerally attempts to put the viewer into the driver's seat and keep him there, although Ford v Ferrari draws clear influence and comes close, and in this particular Porsche, it is unlike anything else. There is no pure car movie out there quite like Le Mans, and no car in it quite like the Porsche, even in a field of similarly stunning Ferraris, Alfa Romeos, and GT40s. McQueen's relentless machine didn't just crush the field like Christine crushed bullies, but it turned heads unlike almost any other car ever shot, which is why we think it's one of the best movie cars of all time. So what do you think? Disagree with any of our picks? Did we leave out any of your favorite movie cars? Let us know in the comments and be sure to subscribe for more Cinefix movie lists.